And now, for our feature presentation. Are you ready? Streaming live around the world, this is Paper Cuts with Brad and Jay. Hey, what a stupid question. <laughs> oh, I've already had two glasses, too, of Tennessee whiskey. Jay, we've done, you've done so good, and you have to muck it up right at the end. <laughs> Jay's gray. He's all gray now. We get his beard. <laughs> I, mean, I got grayer, right? <laughs> uh, everyone in the chat, thanks for stopping by and join yourselves. We know you did. Just get three <laughs> here with us. Tonight, we talk about letters to the Purple Satin Killer with Joshua Chaplinski. Welcome to the show. All right, everyone. Welcome to a Saturday edition of Paper Cuts. I, uh, quick thanks to everyone who uh, told your spouse or your significant <laughs> other that we're not going to go out tonight and party because we need to stay home and watch the latest episode of Paper Cuts. I appreciate that. <laughs> Brad appreciates that. Brad's over there in Kentucky. I'm here as usual. Uh, now, both Brad and I, we're, we're fans of uh, the now def- defunct show on Netflix, Mindhunter. Mm-hmm. So it was a no-brainer when we had a chance to uh, chat with our guest this evening about his upcoming book, Letters to the Purple Satin Killer, because it just had us written all over it. Anyone else fans of that show, too? My greasy old fingerprints all over it. Jeez. I know. Yeah, I know. It's just, it's not, what's that? Potato chips? You, know, you got to <laughs> eat butter from popcorn? You got it. Welcome to the program, Joshua Traplinski. I said it right, Correct. That is correct, Plinsky. Thank you. For if I do anything this evening, I got the name right. Um, <laughs> That's all that matters. Yeah, Josh, welcome to the show. I don't know if you know much about the show, but uh, I know you guys forget, got a snazzy intro. Yeah, forget every, forget everything you heard. <laughs> it's, it's all downhill hopefully. from here, Josh. That was, <laughs> yeah. the, that was the highlight of the show. <laughs> That's the highlight. That's the highlight. We're going to uh, maybe test your knowledge of serial killers a little later. Uh oh. Okay. Uh, but let's just uh, get right into it. Who's your favorite serial killer? <laughs> favorite. Yeah. You know, favorite. Just got to love those guys. You know, it's so hard to choose. So many uh, great a, serial killers. What a great killers. way to start the show, Jay. <laughs> so many great serial killers out there have done such great work. It's really, yeah. you know, it's which, which one do you admire the most? <laughs> mm. Right. I mean, well, I will say that a lot of uh, letters to the Purple Satin Killer, uh, the main character, Jonas Williker, a lot of the big beats of the story were kind of based on uh, Ted Bundy, at least as far as what happened after he was caught and like the shenanigans with him in the courtroom and stuff like that. Right. And him escaping a couple times. And so I would say, you know, Ted Bundy's up there. He's one of the greats. <laughs> well, one I mean, of the big influences. I say that because, it, it, jokingly, but there are probably admirers of serial killers out there. Oh yeah, you know that might oh, read sure. this and be like, you know what? That's kind of like the BTK. You know, that's my. That maybe that's a little Charles Manson. Maybe that's you know what I mean. Just out of nowhere, yeah. just started to relate to it. And then you have the copycat ones that are they can't live up to uh, you know proper potential. <laughs> They have to copycat. They mm-hmm. And yeah, they have no no originality of their own. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> not at all. So, Joshua, thank you so much for joining us. What are you normally doing on a Saturday night? Are, are, are we interrupting your plans for uh, Saturday? Uh, actually, well, you know, I like to lay low as often as possible, especially when in the day job I'm in work mode and I'm working a lot. Mm-hmm. So this is nice Saturday evening home alone. It was a good excuse to tell my friends, oh, I can, you know, I can't come out. I got important. <laughs> Exactly. Book business. I got to promote my book. You know, I can't make it to so and so's birthday bash or whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. so this suits me just fine. Well, I mean, that way you don't have to come up with an excuse to leave early from the party. So, oh, yeah. I'm a notorious early leaver. Right. right, right. And I, I usually give the old the uh, Irish goodbye where, you know, yeah. there's so many people. If you say goodbye to everyone, that's half the night in itself. So, just yeah. slip on out of there. Just peace out. I, I normally yeah. like when we first get to a party. I normally start saying my goodbyes right away because it takes. Oh a while yeah, don't even go. say hello. Just start yeah. with goodbye. Yeah, yeah. I'll hour, be hour later, yeah. I'm in the car waiting for the wife, or we're just trying to get out of there. So yeah, smart yeah. move. 
So we have uh, in a couple of weeks the release of, of this book, right? What have we looked? August 6th, yeah, is that correct? August 6th. So about a little under three weeks. Nice. Are you so doing some name... sort of tour or anything with it? Uh, book not signings. a tour per se. I'm going to be doing a couple readings. Uh, the publisher Clash is helping me. They're going to be setting up a few readings for me here in New York. I'd like to do some traveling, hit some, you know, do some readings out of state, do some cons or whatever. But I think the consensus is we really got to wait and see until after the book comes out, what kind of opportunities okay. come my way. You know, I'd love to, you know, hit some of the, the horror cons and stuff. I've never really done that, the horror con mm -hmm. thing. So, and, you know, once I have a book to promote, you know, anything that comes up, I think I'm going to try to hit stuff that's in drivable distance. <laughs> Can you tell whoever's watching and listening what the book is about? You know, the titles kind of gives it away, but more in depth. What is what is letters? To the sure, it's a, what, what's it about? It's about uh, a serial killer named Jonas Williker, and it's told uh, through letters written to him. You don't get to read any responses he may write back to these people. It's all it, the whole story is told through letters written to him while. He's on trial, and while he's on death row, leading up to his execution, uh, friends, family members, so-called you know fans, like we were talking about, like you know, uh, it, that that exists in the real world. Fans mm -hmm. of serial killers, people who write to serial killers, and tell them about how much they admire them, and if they want to meet them, they want to marry them. That stuff happens yeah. <laughs> all the time. And some are very explicit, by the way. <laughs> sure. I mean, you know, I uh, I was reading one true crime book, and it was talking about how one serial killer was writing to people on the outside, and they were amazed that no one was checking these letters for content because th this killer was, you know, if he had a rapport with someone and kind of made a connection with them he would just start telling them stuff about murders and it's some of them even it seemed like information on murders that weren't attributed to him or weren't solved you know and there was nobody kind of like you know following up and investigating just in case he dropped some you know potential tidbits you know yeah that, that's interesting because, yeah, not nothing's really being monitored. So, like, he could have a full confession in one of these letters out. Sure. And other, I people, mean, other people may have full confessions and letters coming into them. Yeah. Of unsolved I mean, they, murders, you know. They're supposed to check the mail. and But in some of the research and reading I did, you know, people get lazy. They slack off on the job or they just don't care and stuff gets through. Right. I found the the way you laid this out really interesting that it's all letters to him and nothing from you know his perspective. Was that like a specific point you wanted to make? You only wanted it to be stuff written to him and never have anything from his uh, point of view at all? Yeah, I mean, it's a decision I made early on. And I can't remember exactly why I made that decision other than the fact that I thought it was just a cool little flourish, you know, like a kind of... Mm -hmm a rule, you know, a rule to put on myself while I was writing, be like, oh, it can only be letters to him. We're not going to hear from him, you know? Mm -hmm. And then as I, as I wrote and got along in the process, you know, it kind of made more sense to me in terms of, you know, he's essentially the main character of the book and he's this awful person who's done awful things, but, and you want, you don't necessarily want to like, you know, glorify him or I, I just found that it was it was a good way to, you know, get inside his head and and see what he was about without actually living inside his head and kind of mm -hmm. like it, you know, getting a little too grimy. Right. Well, I mean, it, it allows you to fill in the blanks a little bit because some of the responses from the letters he wrote out that we don't read our reference in some of the letters that he's reading, you know, a couple of them said, thanks for writing back. Let mm -hmm. me ask you about this part you mentioned. So then you start wondering, okay, well, what's he writing back and what's in the confession? Maybe he's doing the confession. 
maybe he's given more insight to what you know the FBI didn't figure out and stuff like that. So you know, it allows like a, a little uh, detour to figure out what's he actually writing back to some of these fans and, and and friends and stuff on the outside. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's a little more fun that way. It's a little more of a mystery to be solved because you're getting these bits and pieces from different people, and you know they're not all reliable. You know, you're hearing stuff from his mother about his childhood, and then you're getting poor letters mama. from people who, oh yeah, <laughs> poor mother. We, we were talking but, uh, before you got on about how, that, just that character, the mother, the yeah, the ups and downs, and the, the disbelief, and and I, without giving away anything, but that's one I think readers are going to you know attach themselves to the mother of the of the story. So mm-hmm. sure, because I mean, you got to wonder in real life of you know. The mothers, the fathers of people who have done some of these things, how they must feel, how much, right. how it affects them. You know, it's it's got to be, it's got to be awful. Yeah, yeah. But Did uh, you have... so, go ahead. Sorry. I oh, know I was just trying to remember where where I was before that, but <laughs> go, go on. I lost it. So how did I know, writers probably hate this question? Probably get all the time, but like, where did this idea come from that you wanted to? only write letters to the killer instead of you know, the other way around. This was just a cool idea that popped in your head one day. I think I read it started out as a short story. Is that correct? Yeah, it started out as a short story. Uh, it was published in Thug Lit by Todd Robinson, which was a great crime magazine that doesn't exist anymore. And um, it was kind of early on in my short story writing career, and I really wanted to get published in Thug Lit. You know, I wanted a story in Thug Lit really bad because it was a, a really well-respected magazine. It's a magazine I really liked. And um, I hadn't really written that much crime-related stuff up until that point. So I was like, all right, I got to write a crime story. for And um, I, I had been watching the Netflix series Making a Murderer at the time. And there was this bit in it with Stephen Avery's talking about it. He's like... I, I don't remember exactly ha- how it happened because it was a while ago, but there was, you know, he was getting calls in jail from his, you know, fiance. And this was a woman on the outside who he kind of met after he was arrested and she would visit him. And then, you know, they started a relationship and they got engaged and they would talk on the phone. And that was kind of, I found that really interesting, especially because there were, there was some mention of, you know, I started wondering about information exchange and how, you know, what she would learn from him talking to him on the phone, but then maybe she would learn or hear differently from other things on the outside and, you know, how that would affect their relationship and the kind of unreliability of the flow of information. So that was really the impetus for the story. And of course, you know, then the fact that prisoners get letters all the time it's one of their main forms of communication so it just right away the story lent itself to being told via letters and like i said earlier the the idea of just leaving him out not Mm -hmm. again i'm not really sure when and where i decided on that but when Mm -hmm. i did hit upon it i just thought oh that's pretty cool and and it's a good way it's like because i it's really more about the other people's stories the people writing the letters and through their stories you do learn a lot about right. the killer, Jonas Williker. Mm-hmm. But again, in the end, it's like, it just kind of eases up on the, just the kind of awfulness of being in a serial killer's head for 400 pages, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and at well, the same time, trying to figure out the psyche of the people writing him, like what is attracting them so much to this, you know, vile person, so much wanting to be married to him or sending, you know, explicit letters or mm-hmm. all that stuff. Just, it was outrageous. It, it was crazy. I mean, <laughs> it, it was, it was, there were times I'm like, what the hell did I just read? But, sure, it, but it, it was so entertaining that it was just like, I couldn't stop, you know? So, but as, as outrageous as some of that stuff is, most of it was based on stuff that has happened in real life. So, yeah, the- you know, as, as unbelievable as it might seem like, People have done those things, and it's it's crazy. Yeah. What was the uh, the original short story? Was it also a letter, or was it more of like your your normal kind of story? And then the, the yeah, it was it was it was epistolary, and it okay. featured just a few of the main characters that I ported over into 
uh, the novel, uh, the mother, Ginny Williker. I mean, not Ginny, the mother, Ginny Goodwinch, Ginny yeah. Goodwinch, the woman who's kind of like just like you obsessed, uh, kind of <laughs> yeah. obsessed with him, in love with him, but in a you know in a more romantic way. Like I think he'd be a good father for my children, kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, those those two especially were they were kind of the main focus of that original short story. And in the original short story, it's interesting. I think all the characters were women. And that was another thing I didn't necessarily start out to do on purpose. But then once I realized it, I was like, oh, again, it makes it interesting that it's all women telling this story. Mm -hmm. Then when I expanded it into the novel, um, I kind of expanded it to include some men as well, because I felt the short story it was that story, those women, it was their story. And it was kind of about a, a woman's relationship with this kind of person. In, right. the, in the novel, it, it got a little broader than that. What was it about the story that you wanted to expand it into a full length novel? You know, I didn't like anything else. I didn't, I kind of didn't really intend on turning it into a novel, but uh-huh. Every once in a while, while I was trying to write some other stuff, I would brainstorm like a new character for it. Like one of the first new characters I wrote for the novel was the character of this um, this character who's like in a, in a metal band and like that's his attraction okay. and he starts writing him letters. And I just thought it was a, a funny, interesting character. And I was like, oh, if I ever expanded it, I would include this guy, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and, and then I would maybe, you know, write out a few letters from this new character you know, not even fully intending on using it, but mm-hmm. then um, I was I was working on another novel, uh, a follow up to my my first novel, The Paradox Twins, which Clash also put out, and I was kind of hitting the wall with it, and I I wanted to finish something and get something out, you know, relatively quickly after the first novel and I, you know, relatively quickly being like, you know, a couple of years. <laughs> and so, so I, was, I was having issues with this one work in progress. And so I started thinking more and more about per satin killer and the kind of like extra little characters and chapters I had created. And I was like, Oh, well, it'll be easy to, to expand this into maybe like a 20,000 word novella, you know, mm-hmm. something I could put out right. real quick as like a stopgap release just to keep people's interest so they don't forget about me. Yeah. And of course, that was a huge mistake because it wasn't easy. <laughs> and 90,000 words. And two years later, you know, here we are with Purple Satin Killer, the novel version. Yeah, I feel like the way you wrote it, it all being letters, all epistolatory, I feel like that would be a lot harder than just your traditional, you know, tale of, you know, true crime story or murder mystery or how are you? How are you? Well, I mean, especially since I wrote it out of order, that was really my, oh yeah, my my big misstep was writing it out of order because then as it got bigger and bigger, and I started kind of, you know, sequencing it, I ran into problems with, you know, with dates and people's ages and where they lived and the timeline and all that stuff. And being kind of a perfectionist, I wanted it all to make mathematical sense. You know, every letter is dated. Um, yeah. there's a timeline of the murders. Every single murder has a specific date. I have the dates and names and places of all the murders mapped out. And, you know, I wanted it all to, to flow cohesively and make sense. And even if, you know, your average person would read it and not do the math in their head, it was important to me that, that it added up. So that was probably the most difficult thing about it. And what took the longest in the end was, was sequencing the uh the letters and i would do i did everything from you know i printed everything out i had excel spreadsheets and they were color coded and you know collating the information all these different ways and printing everything out and flipping the pages around and so yeah it was not the quick easy fix i thought it was going to be writing the letters out of order did you write all of the letters for each character at a time or were they mixed up too uh, well, there were a lot, like, as I went on, I would go back and add letters to a character and because I would okay. be like, oh, and then I got to pad out this story. I got to flesh this out. Uh, there's more to be said here and it, it relates to this. And I, so there were 
there was some jumping back and forth, but like when I would come up with a new character, I would sit and like write three or four letters and kind of like yeah. map out their their mini arc, you know, because each right. each character who writes to this killer, they have like their own mini narrative arc, you know. So I would kind of map that out first, and then you know add to it where necessary. Was that a challenge to have all these mini arcs, but you also have kind of the overall arc of Jonas being told as well? Was that a challenging thing to, to do? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, because um, sometimes I would come up with what I thought was a, a cool character or, you know, just an interesting something based on an interesting factoid out of real life or something. And then I'd write a letter based on that. And then I'd be like, well, if I'm going to have multiple letters from this character, they have to have, you know, it has to be interesting and they have to have their own arc. Otherwise, it's just kind of you know, it's not as it's not as going to be as fulfilling for the, the reader, and it's just going to seem more like a just a random bunch of letters, you know. Yeah, I, I was yeah. wondering, like, how much, how big of a challenge is that? You have several characters in here, and each one There's has their mini arc, you know. Where it's probably sometimes hard enough just for one character in a novel to have its main arc. You have several. Like, yeah. <laughs> how how challenging is that? What was the mindset in going into these letters when you're writing them? Like, did you? transform yourself to the mother transform yourself to jenny to candace to you know what i mean and had to write from their point of view while also keeping the story straight with the actual main killer even though he's not responding on our side yeah i mean the characters like uh jenny and the mother i kind of had been with them the longest and knew them the best so they yeah. after a while they were kind of the easiest ones to write you know it was later on as i was adding in characters and trying to you know, shore everything up that it, it got a little more difficult. But yeah, I mean, it was it was tough. It was, I made a huge mistake thinking that it was going to be <laughs> this quick, easy thing. Well, I mean, it, it, it's cool that you were able to do it. I mean, and they get involved. Some of these letters get involved. I'm interested to know when you presented this to Clash. Hey, I got this this uh, concept. A bunch of letters to a killer. <laughs> what was their response? What, what what was what was their reaction? How did you sell this to Clash? I mean, granted, Clash. For those who don't know, Clash, they they have some oddities that that are you know that are out there. Some some books that are out there that are pretty cool. That a little bit different. You know, they're not straight horror, or straight lit. You know, but and, and it fits perfectly with Clash. But what was their what was their uh, response when you brought this to them? I mean, yeah, Clash is game for just about anything. And, yeah. you know, like I said, it, it did exist first as a short story. And the short story was a part of my story collection, Whispers in the Ear of a Dreaming Ape, which Clash did put out. Mm -hmm. It was the first book of mine that Clash put out. And so they were they were familiar with the story. And not only that, it, it was probably their favorite story in the collection. It, it was the leadoff story in the collection. And we even talked about it at one point as that being the title of the story collection, which at the time I didn't really feel worked. And in retrospect, now I'm glad we didn't <laughs> name it that because it would present a whole nother set of problems now that I've written a whole book called Letters to the Purple Sound Killer. Uh -huh. But so basically that was, you know, another, that that went along with the, oh, this is going to be an easy, quick sell because I knew Clash like just short story. So I, right. In my head, it was already a yes that I was like, "Hey, this story you like? Oh, let's let's make it a little longer and, and and get it out there, you know." And then they, I that's initially how I pitched it to them, and they they were cool and they were like, "Yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it." And then a few months went by, and I'm like, "Hey, I'm still working on it. It's up to thirty thousand words. I think I'm almost done." <laughs> then a few more months would go by, and I'd be like, "All right, I think it's capping out at about fifty. We're really getting there, you know." It's just like every time I ran. My in the beginning, my whole thing was, you know, like I said, quick and easy. I want to just get something done. And then as I was going along and I was, you know, encountering narrative problems, the answer always seemed to be flesh it out, you know. Yeah. And write in my head, more. I was like, I was like, shit, I wanted this to be easy. I don't want to write more. And I would try to get around it somehow and then hit that wall again. And that little voice in my head was like, idiot. Flesh it out. That's the problem. You got to flesh it out. And so once I started listening to that voice and just gave up all hope of it being this 
quick, easy thing, you know, and and let it be the length it needed to be. It's like you um, kept finding new letters. <laughs> yeah, that that's, new letters that, were uncovered. So that's when the you know that's when the problems started solving themselves. Yeah. yeah. Why make it? Uh, I can't even say that word. The e word. He pistol. I can't say it, but, Yeah. Why make it like that and not just a regular straight novel? What what was what is it about that format that that drew you? I mean, it works, but what what is it about that? Are you a fan of other stories and books that are written in that format or? Definitely. I'm in general, I'm a big fan of um, kind of experimenting with form and, you know, novels that kind of take on a different shape than your standard, you know, standard narrative story. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm always looking for different ways to tell a story just for my own sake to keep myself entertained. And because I, when I see stories like that, I'm like, oh, this is cool. You know, I wish I wrote this. I wish I thought of this. So, you know, this one, like I said, it kind of lent itself to the epistolary, epistolary format because it was about a guy in prison and, you know, guys right. in prison get tons of letters. So it was yeah. kind of a no brainer to tell a story that way. But uh, yeah, so I didn't force it. But like once I was uh, decided to tell the story that way, I was excited because I love, uh, you know, telling stories in different different ways. Um, and the epistolary format is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a format that's been around for a really long time. Um, and, uh, there are, there are tons of great epistolary, epistolary novels and a, t a ton of great horror and crime epistolary novels. You know, I think the, it really lends itself to those genres just because of the kind of like the conf confession and confession, confessionary yeah, you know, the confessional nature. You're an author. Of, you can make up whatever word yeah, you want to. Make, make up a word. The, the we'll make a trend. Yeah. <laughs> the confessional nature of writing letters and also the kind of like voyeuristic aspect of reading someone's letters, maybe letters that aren't to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, to I, me, I, I those, that's also the, really appealing. I can see the voyeurism in it, definitely. Uh, Paul Shepard in the, in the, in the, chat here he, he uh says it's similar to ramp by chuck polinick and polinick someone who uh experiments for formatting and stuff too so that and i i kind of got that feeling that you know because he likes to change the way he writes stuff too so. yeah yeah oh yeah rant's a rant's a great novel i'm a big fan it's more of a kind of like oral history which you know mm -hmm. you can kind of kind of falls into the category of pistolary these days, like epistolary started out as just strictly letter writing, but it's kind of come to, you know, describe books that include all different sorts of ephemera and letters and mm -hmm. like um, uh, magazine articles, newspaper clippings. I think LaRocca's book was all like, was it emails? All emails back and forth? Yeah, thing? emails. You know, I guess something it's kind like, of like a letter, but yeah. Yeah, something like a. Uh, uh, the Dennis Cooper novel. What's the one? Now I'm gonna blank on the name because I'm on the spot. Uh, the one where it's all the whole thing is guys in chat rooms talking about. Oh, 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 oh yeah. I, uh, what is the name of that? Now, now you're now I'm just gonna be on my brain all night trying to figure that one out. I literally have... reference that book in like every interview <laughs> I've done, and right now it, it's just whoop, gone from my brain. Now I, got, now I got to look it up. Great, thanks. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you kind of you kind of touched on that a little bit in the book with like the where the lady would post the poems on the like the forum and mm -hmm. send back the like the comments to him and stuff. Oh like, yeah, that was definitely a little bit the inspired by that. Yeah, trying to kind of like stretch the the letter format and, and include other little formats. Yeah, it's definitely. Definitely inspired so, by that. So, like, how much time did you spend, like, thinking of all the different, I guess, types of people that would write him letters? Because, like, you have, like, memorabilia services and, like, victims, friends, and family, and, you know, the mom and people that are in love with him and just weird sex things and all kinds of stuff. Like, where did all these ideas just, like, come in? Or are you, like, researching things? All oh, these are letters that people have written, serial killers of your life, or kind of combination of both? Yeah, some of, some of them came easier than others. Like I said, some were there from the beginning, like the character of the mother, obviously. And uh, Ginny and Candace were kind of like both inspired by making a murderer, the kind of like, you know, 
women being attracted to men in prison. So, and then there there was like the preacher's daughter, which that one yeah. that was an early one, and um, and then for the novel, I came up with this, you know, this friend of his from when he was a child who was kind of like yeah. never really reconciled their relationship, and you know, I found that I kind of tried to build like the emotion of of the the emotional emotional parts of the novel through these mm -hmm. characters you know because i didn't want it to just be a bunch of random people talking about random horrific stuff i knew if i was gonna get people to come along with me on this there had to be some heart to it you know so there is yeah. all this this kind of like harsh weird one-off stuff that i found like just scouring the internet and and reading about serial killers and stuff and be like, oh, that's a cool, weird tidbit. Let me throw this guy in. Oh, that's another one. Let me throw that in. You know? yeah. But it needed to have the foundation of the characters that brought an you know, emotion to it. Because sure. mm -hmm. even the cool. one-off ones, like the the competing like memorabilia people, like even mm -hmm. they have like a little arc where they're they don't like each other and they've done stuff yeah, yeah. in the past and stuff. Yeah, like to me, though there are there are two kind of main types of characters like i said the kind of like the emotional ones and then the more fun one-off ones and the, those that character was kind of more one of the fun ones that i had, and i forget exactly how that came about i just initially well i was reading about you know murderabilia and people who collect memorabilia from serial killers and i'll be i was like oh it's you know it's an interesting character a guy who sells you know serial killer memorabilia and then i was like well how do what's this guy's arc how do i make this interesting like where does where do i go with this and yeah. then i kind of came up with the idea of the, uh, the another guy competing with him you know in the same <laughs> business because otherwise it just would have been a guy who's like hey i sell i sell weird shit, you know let me yeah. <laughs> let me sell, sell let me sell your fingernail clippings and your pubes and whatnot yeah. and, and, and then, you know, then who are the people who buy it too that that, oh, might, yeah, be a whole, sure. that might be a whole different book for that's a whole right new there. book yeah yeah i think the dennis cooper book is closer is it closer or no that's no. not the one Frisk. i probably have it Frisk. right here no it's not frisk either ah, i'm dying over here and it's it's gonna be right Jay, you here. haven't read it you don't even know what you're talking about no i <laughs> I've read a, the sluts. Uh, I read that. Sluts. By that's it. It's sluts. That's, yeah, yes, yeah. The that's sluts. What, I was gonna get it eventually. How? How did I forget the title? Forget that. I don't one. know. I don't know. <laughs> and like I, I, I literally. I don't, why, I don't know why I said frisk. I bet I should have said sluts first. I've yeah. been referencing it so much because of Letters to the Purple Satin Killer, and it's a book I've recommended all the time. And I just, I don't know why I completely blanked on the sluts. <laughs> yeah. uh. <laughs> how did you blank on the sluts? <laughs> so, uh, one thing i i don't want to i don't want to give it away but the one inclusion was like the some of the stuff from the anonymous person i thought that was mm -hmm. really cool because some of them have pictures or i guess their postcards have been sent mm -hmm. and i guess you find out later on what's kind of actually going on with that i, I really like that kind of reveal of what the postcards were because at first i didn't i just thought they were random postcards mm -hmm. but later you get into the book you kind of figure out what what those actually mean i, I thought that was really cool yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to, you know, again, kind of inject kind of some different forms into it and also build a little bit of a mystery, not have everything be so cut and dry. Um, you know, like I said, I use a lot of conflicting narratives and you get conflicting information from different characters. And, you know, so not everyone's reliable and you don't really know what the truth is a lot of times. And I, you know, the postcards kind of expands on that you don't really know who they're coming from and yeah. and and what's going on so I, I i wanted to have a little a little more ambiguity that's that's what i used to inject the ambiguity into the story there's one post postcard i won't give it away but it connects to another person's letter and i was like oh that that lines up really well I like that it kind of gives a clue as to maybe what happened i'll, I'll maybe yeah tell you yeah once we're done because it's a spoiler but I, I yeah because really like i wanted I people good. to I wanted there to be like a little puzzle aspect of like people putting together like, oh, who is this? Who's sending these? Who is this in reference to? You know, and yeah. they do correspond. You know, there are there are some red herrings in there, but they do. I have an idea of like, you know, who sent that and what that means. But I wanted mm -hmm. that to be in there for people to have a little something where they could have have their own little theories about what was going on there. You know, 
And there's also um, there's a survivor, someone who escaped him, who sends him letters. Mm-hmm. And I thought her arc was really interesting too. Yeah, that. Um... Kind of, I don't know if she's kind of going crazy or if what's going on with her. By the time it's over for her arc, I really liked her arc too. Yeah, I, that was. She's another uh, one of the more important characters in the book, and um, kind of kind of influenced by there's this uh found footage or faux documentary horror movie i really liked called the poughkeepsie tapes uh, mm-hmm. i don't know if oh, you've yeah, ever yeah. seen it yeah. and it has yeah. to do with a serial killer I'm and there was shutter, probably. yeah it, it's a good one and uh it it had to do with uh there was one aspect of it that had to do with like um uh what's the what's it called not munchausen syndrome but the other uh, stockholm syndrome you know, where like people who get attached to people who have kidnapped them or whatnot, and like that kind of influenced that part of the story. Uh, you know, just how I want a character who might, you know, you would think someone who escaped such a horrible situation would be happy and would be done with it, but mm-hmm. you know, there's kind of like a, a longing there, like some someone who's been damaged and is like longing for the thing that damaged them, you know. Yeah, and and at, the, at the same time, it seemed like I was saying at the same at the same time, the one that got away also seemed like uh, they were kind of rubbing it in his face that yeah, yeah, yeah shifting the power dynamic they, yeah, over her and, and that they're they're in power now and that his life's over with, but their life continues. They yeah, couldn't fin- he couldn't finish the job basically because they got away. Sure. So. Well, yeah, it kind of starts that way, but then yeah. like you see, it kind of reveals like they kind of either. It was at front, or they they kind of fall back on these emotions, yeah. and they're like, you know, forget what I said. I'm not the one in control. Please don't leave <laughs> yeah. me. I love you. That right, kind of thing, right. You know? I thought that was an interesting dynamic. Did you get, you got to wonder like, there's going to be a void in their life after you know the end. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was talking about, you know, one of the postcards. You see that, and then later on, from another letter, you kind of they're kind of linked. So was it? important important like the sequencing of the order you put all these letters in for the book did you work really hard definitely definitely yeah and towards the end i was discover even towards the end i was discovering new ways to link some of the characters and their stories you know like a lot of that i didn't discover till later on in the Mm -hmm. writing and i feel that it you know it's something that was important to me it gives the, the novel as a whole much more cohesion you know so a lot of that those little connections weren't there until very close to the end where I was like, Oh, wait a minute, this corresponds with this. And, you know, these people are kind of connected in this way. And if I just tweak it a little bit, you know, it it brings it that much closer together. There were two characters. I won't say who gets together, but there were two that end up intertwining. I was like, wow, that was, that was kind of really strange how that happened from the way they start out to what happens to them at the end. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that was that was like kind of just organically as I was writing their stories, it just kind of made sense, you know. Yeah. Did you have a, a favorite character to write from their perspective for? Hmm, that's a tough. I mean, I did really enjoy the character of the the best friend from childhood. Oh yeah, you know, I think his, yeah. his name was William. I think right, William. William, yeah. Like I got to, again, he's another one. I kind of discovered what he was about as it went along, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm really happy with where his story went. I just felt like, you know, I didn't want it to be this black or white thing where like this person is obviously good or in the right you know and this person is in the wrong like i wanted i tried to do with a lot of the characters like the one that got away like they you know they're multifaceted and they you know they've been hurt but then there's also there's like they do or say or think these things where the average person would be like what are you crazy like yeah. why would you think that why would you do that look what happened to you you know like so i just i i enjoyed his character because of uh the kind of ride his character took. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, his boyfriend was obnoxious. I didn't like the, his boyfriend at all. Or his partner. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, well, that was like another thing. Like, he's kind of like, he seems better off, but he's kind of traded one sort of, not abusive, but like one, you know, 
less than this perfect relationship kind of, for yeah. another, you know, like yeah. always kind of relying on someone else to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why the, uh, the, the piece of fabric, the, the purple satin, satin. fabric, why, why is that the calling card? I, I know a lot of serial killers had a calling card, like a, like a, like a pattern or, or whatever, but mm -hmm. where, where, how did you get to that settle on, on that particular one? That just came from way back in the beginning with the short story when I decided, all right, I'm writing a story. It's going to be letters to this serial killer. It's got to have a catchy title. Yeah. This serial killer needs, I, I needed a name for the serial killer. I didn't just want it to be Jonas Williger. I wanted them to have like right. a, a title, like, you know, you know, BTK or whatever, or, right. you, know, you know, just. The, I mean, I'm the, I'm going for a purple theme tonight. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, look, no, that's great. I mean, they're they're kind of weird looking, but you know. Yeah, so, honestly, so I, I just was, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, I just you know I was kind of searching for like a cool name. I'm like, this guy needs a cool name. And in my research, you know, a lot of guys got their name from you know either how they killed or you know some sort of calling card they left or whatever. And I just kind of. I think I probably went through a few different ones before I settled on the fabric and the color. You know, mm -hmm. I'm like white fleece killer, you know, <laughs> blue cashmere killer. No, that doesn't sound quite right. Flannel jacket killer. Oh, that's yeah. just too many Mauve colors. Mohair. <laughs> Purple right. satin. That's the one. There you that's go. it. Yeah. I mean, it could have been I silk, but, you know, satin might be cheaper. I don't know. Well, I did actually, I did a little research because at one point I was, I asked my wife, I was like, are satin and silk the same thing? Like, and then I looked it up and satin is a type of silk. Oh, it's just, okay. It's, it has something to do with how it's woven that makes it satin. So it's okay. kind of interesting. Learn something new there. Yeah. Honestly, when I got the book, I looked it up to see if this was a real killer that I had just never heard of before. So this all sounds legit. <laughs> All these letters and stuff. Is this real? Is this fiction? Is this nonfiction? I had to look it up because I was curious. Yeah. I didn't know. I had a couple of early readers who said the same thing. They were like, I had to stop and go look it up and make sure this wasn't an actual real killer because it all it seems feels real. so it feels real like to me. The real and, thing. Yeah. You know, and that's that's a huge compliment. I really appreciate that. We'll have to wait and see if it ends up in libraries and see what part they put it the in. The non -fic the fiction in. or nonfiction. <laughs> like the maybe, maybe, maybe you'll yeah. fake them out too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Speaking of uh, early readers, what, what's the feedback been like for you? Uh, it, it's been really good. I've been really happy. You know, I've made a, a pretty concerted effort to try to get it out there to as many people as possible. You know, specifically, you know, like um, bookstagrammers and book talkers and like um, the horror groups on Facebook and so, right. stuff like that. People who, you know, just just kind of like non-professional people who read and review and share. Cause I, <laughs> that's like, we're not professional. Like you guys, just like you guys, you know, cause like, as far as, you know, review stuff, it's just cause like, honestly, those are kind of more important and make a bigger difference when like people who read because they love it and review because they love it and want to share right. the mm -hmm. stuff they love, you know, you, you get, you get the right people to really embrace something. And then that's how, you know, you get word of mouth. That's really what sells a book these days is word of mouth. You know, yeah. you get, you know, I can get a, like I was talking to someone else recently and I was lucky enough to get a bunch of really good blurbs for this book. Like I, I had a huge list. I, I sent it out to a bunch of, you know, pretty high profile writers like Paul Tremblay, blurb the book for me clay mcleod chapman blurb the book for me rob hart who you know i have a past relationship with but he's you know he's a he's got a more high profile writer at this point um, is he then, the one you know, that the, came out the new assassins book is that yeah he wrote okay. assassins anonymous uh, okay. i know him because we work together at the reactor um mm -hmm. but like you know people like that and uh who blurb the book and um i'm really grateful for that and you would think that I was having a conversation with someone and they were like, Oh man, you got such great blurbs for the book. And I was like almost half jokingly. Yeah. Well, we'll see if that actually sells any books or not, you know, because it doesn't always, you know, it looks great 
And mm -hmm. lots of people read Paul Tremblay's books. Lots of people read Clay McLeod Chapman's books, but that doesn't necessarily read. They're going to read every book that they kind of, you know, right. say, Hey, this was good. I like this. You know, I mean, maybe if Stephen King blurbed your book, you know, you're going to see a significant uptick in readers, but yeah, I feel like the, the really important thing is to connect with, you know, actual readers and like the people who are yeah. reviewing because they, they like a book, you know, and if you get them to really champion your book, that's, that's when you're going to see a difference. So, yeah, well, that, that's actually how the, the show was kind of born because we both did uh, YouTube videos of reviews Book two is what it was called. <laughs> I couldn't yeah, think of what it was called, Brad. Yeah, we used to do our review. Well, I, he still does every now and then, but uh, just review, make a video on YouTube and review yeah. a book. That's what we used to, uh, and the show kind of created from that. So, yeah. So yeah, the normal people, it's the normal people. We were reading stuff <laughs> and reviewing it for the normal, not the yeah, the normies, yeah, for the you know our neighbors and stuff. So yeah, because I mean. <laughs> I don't know. That's like, it's just, I don't know what I was going to say there. I lost my thought. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, exactly. It's the normal people. If they champion your stuff, you know, you could have reviews in magazines and stuff like that. But, you know, you want people who actually love reading to read your book. Well, I, I'm sure your your uh, IP address, your computer is marked by the FBI now for the uh, <laughs> oh, research. Sure. So, what do you say we we test your knowledge a little bit of? Oh uh, man, of serial killers. If we could sure. do that, it, <laughs> I'm I'm gonna say the, right hey, up front. These are I'm, easy because I came recall, up with them. Through. Okay, my recall of like trivia and facts and stuff is so bad. And as we go with the sluts, even if it's a book I've read multiple times and love, yeah. like if I get put on the spot, but let's let's do it. Let's go for they, it. These are these are easy. The, All right. It, it, my 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 assistant's probably marked now because I looked up serial killer trivia earlier today, <laughs> and then like, so they're like probably watching what I'm doing right now. So. All right. All right. Jay, do you want to do a killer quiz, Jay? Yeah, quiz. so we're going to call it so a, a stupid. killer quiz. Killer, killer quiz. quiz. Let's go for it. K-W-I. That's what you came up with? That's what I came up with, Jay. I was busy today. Nice. <laughs> okay, okay. We'll see. Hey, don't talk trash about my, my video unless your questions are, are not good. We'll see what your questions are, because usually yeah. they're terrible, Jay. The questions see, are the important part. Well, That's well, right. the thing is, like... We've done games in the past, and when I've put together the questions, they're usually they usually terrible. no, they're usually just they just usually stump the guest. I mean, <laughs> these are pretty easy this time, I think so. Okay, all okay. right, okay. Well, let's well, let's see. Number one, Robert Ressler coined the term serial killer while a member of the criminal apprehension program in what organization during the nineteen seventies? The FBI. Yeah. See, see, that's simple. That's easy. <laughs> Anybody who's I, watched Mindhunter knew that too. Yeah, I figure <laughs> right. even if you didn't know it, you could make a pretty good guess. Yeah, pretty good guess yeah. on that one. I mean, you got FBI. You could you could say a few others, but that would come to my mind. So, okay, number two, Thomas Harris's 1981 novel Red Dragon marks the first appearance of what dubious serial, serial killer who was famously portrayed by Anthony Hopkins a decade later? <laughs> that would be Hannibal Lecter. There you go. Okay. This one I didn't know because I'm not much. Uh, I, I mean, I know the rapper, but I'm not into rap music. But oh, we'll see uh, if I get this one in. Yeah. <laughs> Serial killer Ted Bundy is referenced in the song Stay Wide Awake by what famous Detroit rapper? Oh, well, I probably wouldn't know the answer, but Detroit makes me think it's Eminem. Yeah. Let's see. Three for three. Did you do that was one, it, Was it Marshall Mathers? Was it Eminem? Or was it the real Slim Shady? Oh, for that, I, I <laughs> Dude. No idea. Yeah. I, that, yeah. What? I, okay. Shut up, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he had a new CD drop the other day, just so people know. Yeah. What killer was never caught after a string of California murders in the 20th century? Ooh. This killer self-identified with a cross-circle symbol. That would be the Zodiac Killer. Yeah. I said, yeah, like, you know, that was exciting. <laughs> or something. 
Yeah. Well, just because that makes me think of the movie Zodiac, the Fincher movie, yeah. which is such a great one of the That's best one. serial killer movies ever made. This one was new to me. I didn't I didn't know these uh, nicknames, these alternative monikers. But the Whitechapel murderer and Leather Apron are two alternative monikers used to refer to what famous London serial killer? Mm, that would be Jack the Ripper. Yes. Did the London part give it away, or did you really know that? I know that it's the, the Whitechapel murders. Okay. You know, that that's what they called his murders. Okay. Uh, so your favorite serial killer, uh, Ted Bundy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, I got close, the t- close friend of mine. Close friend of mine. I got the T-shirt. I'm in a fan. That'll club. be the one clip they take out of context for the entire episode. <laughs> yeah, really. Josh is like, big buddies with Ted Bundy. Yeah, some, some uh, people in black suits will show up at my house tomorrow and, and, and your place too, and just see what start questioning this. American serial blah. Ted Bundy is an American serial killer who rose to infamy during a string of 70s atrocities. Bundy was eventually caught and legally killed via what method? Huh. Uh, how did they kill Bundy? Did was it I, I I'm not so sure. I, I want to say lethal injection. Is that wrong? If not, then it's did they give him the electric chair? They gave him the chair. Uh, they gave him the chair. Look, he was probably one of the last ones to get. I was the gonna chair, say probably. it might have been a la- Was he the last one that got the chair? Was you say the seventies? Is that when he died? And I, I that was into the eighties. Well, they, was, killed was, they killed him in the eighties, right? The, yeah. His murders were in the seventies, I think. We we need an expert in the chair. I think he was probably one of the real expert. last high high profile people to probably get the chair. Then, if it was the eighties, yeah, sure, yeah, okay. So you missed your first one. All right. A couple more here. <laughs> All right. Which killer of boys and young men performed as Pogo the Clown at charitable events and <laughs> children's parties? Mr. John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy. Okay. You said uh, something in the book about him. I don't know if you remember, but that he gave his brain to science. Was that true? Oh, that yeah. True? That was based on... That's true. He gave his brain to science and they continue to study it to this day. You know, as new as new techniques and stuff are are invented, they try them out on his brain and try to kind of see if they can figure out what makes a serial killer tick. That's crazy. It would still be in good enough condition to experiment on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess they got they got it right away. And then yeah. another related fact that also wound up in the book is that um, Jeffrey Dahmer, I think they he left his brain to science or wanted to and then his mother and father got in like a legal battle over it where one wanted to and one didn't want to and eventually i think they wound up uh whoever you know just wanted to cremate it with the rest of his body won out so they didn't get to study old jeffy's brain yeah that's that's too bad (laughs) it's too bad who knows what we uh which killer was known for eating parts of his victims? <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> it's just kind of ironic and, and coincidental that we were talking about it. So. All right, did final Ed one Gein, here. Did Ed Gein eat people too, or did he just he only killed like I, one person though, didn't he? I don't know how many people he killed, but I think he was he ate faces and stuff. Yeah, I know he's based. Oh, I know leather face is based on leather face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did he eat people, or did he just chop them up? I know he made like their parts. lamps and. I, like yeah. belts and stuff with their skin, weird stuff. He, he might have ate a person or two. You, you gotta assume <laughs> you he know. at least had a nibble to try. Put, put together, taste. put together a, a, a lamp out of somebody's leg. You know, he might have ate a toe or something. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. To be named a serial killer. Final one, by the way. So let's finish okay. strong. To be named a serial killer. What is the minimum amount of victims over Ooh. separate events? Is it three? Mm, close. Brad, what do you got? Go four. I'll one-up him. <laughs> we'll, we'll raise you a dollar. It's actually only two. two. But they have to be separate, separate events, though. So I that, guess, I mean, the, that makes sense. But what if someone kills two people and stops? You know, that's, I mean, I guess it but, is. But a, if they're separate events, I say yeah. they do one today and then do one on Tomorrow. Wednesday. Yeah, you know. But what if, if like, you events. got... A serial killer who's killed like 15 people and then like 
they're hanging out at the serial killer club and a guy comes in and he's like, yeah, I killed two people. They're going to be like, you're not a real serial killer. Well, it, it, yeah. Uh, initiation to the club's probably five. Yeah. You know? But yeah. for the FBI to label him, mm -hmm. syrup, yeah, it must be two. What if you just happen to make two bad mistakes a few years apart? Yeah. <laughs> Are you really a serial bad, killer? Bad, bad food poisoning. Two, two, yeah. Two. It now looks like just... Ed, looks like Ed Gein only killed two people. He was suspected really? of others, but two confirmed. I, wow. feel like he didn't kill, I didn't feel like he killed that many people. That's crazy. Like he mutilated a but lot did he have other people, people in his family that kill people too? Or I know, It says he murdered... Two confirmed murders, seven suspected, and he mutilated uh, nine corpses. So I, I think he was uh, digging people up and doing stuff with them. Well, mm. he's suspected for the other ones, but he was never. But only two confirmed, so maybe that's yeah, why it's yeah. two. I mean, because he, he's, he he's probably, considered. He, he probably did it. Yeah. I'm sure he did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, though, but like digging up and mutilating corpses—is that really that bad? Like, you're not a killer. <laughs> yeah. He, he you know, if, Ed, it, if, just... if Ed Gein had just dug up. And mutilated corpses and never actually kill anyone. He won't be a serial killer, He'd and he would be not a, be as famous a, as he is. So yeah. that's true. He'd just be a really weird dude. Yeah, <laughs> he would just be the neighbor. I mean, yeah, like oh, that's my neighbor. He likes to. He was always quiet, place. but there's always a smell coming from his place. Yeah, <laughs> every news report starts out that way. So are you a? Are you a? Fan? Are you a big fan of true crime? Was that something you're interested in? Yeah, I mean, I do enjoy true crime. You know, uh, especially you know documentary stuff. Um, and now these days, there's just so much true crime content. You know, it's on streaming and whatnot, Netflix, and yeah, you know, it's, oh, it's almost too much now. It's like, all you right, hide, you can't hide from it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah it's, it's like it's not as special as it used to be. Yeah. You know, like, oh, once in a while, I'll allow myself some true crime documentary as a treat. But now it's just like, you know, it's like eating ice cream every night. It, it, it's not that. You become it's, desensitized it's and jaded. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It's like, yeah. You watch but a, I mean, an episode of true crime, and you're like, okay. Yeah. And also, too, like, like a lot of these. Netflix has a new these, one, like, every week. Yeah, there's so much. And, like, for a while, I was watching all of them, and I was getting a little burnt out. And then you do start to feel a little icky like uh like i'm living in this 24 hours a day but yeah. you know it's like a lot of these new series too they really seem to like stretch it out and pad it out it's not yeah. like you know well it's not serious but like true crime like something like thin blue line which is like a masterpiece of a movie and mm -hmm. you know it's however long it is 90 minutes two hours you know and they tell that entire story and now they got got a netflix series on a, a guy and you know, they stretch it out for like ten episodes. You know, yeah. Is it the one the stairs? Isn't that just about the person that fell down the stairs? And it's like ten episodes. Oh long? yeah, like the husband well, actually, pushing down the stairs or whatever happened. Yeah, I think they there's a, a the original documentary, The Stairs, and it was like four hours long. And I think that that was like pre Netflix when that was made. And I think mm -hmm. recently there was like a they made like a mini series of it, like a, a fictional account of it, okay. which I didn't see, but I did see that that original documentary is really good. Yeah, it's about this guy. He, he was kind of a famous writer, and uh, you know his wife died. He, he claimed she fell down the stairs, and but then they were like digging into his past and found out like he was having affairs and all this stuff. And then like there were all these crazy theories, like an owl ripped her. Say, scalp. When an owl like, came in the window yeah. or something, yeah. But like it sounds crazy, but then when they present it and stuff, like it seems kind of credible, mm -hmm. you know. All right, that's a really good one. I think you know what I think recently they had like made like a follow up to like years later like okay. cuz I think the guy wound up wound up in jail for it and he's still claiming like an owl did it or something. That's such a bizarre. Yeah, cuz I I feel like I remember the owl thing cuz it was just such an yeah. odd right aspect of it. So, I mean, wanna... if, if you watch all of those and you get so into them then then you know you go to family functions and that's all you talk about and they start <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you yeah. start getting you start getting the stares from people, and they're like, "Yeah, that's just cousin Josh. We we don't talk to him too too much now, <laughs> you know." Yeah, he's uh he's got a fascination with uh, the BTK killer, and sure. <laughs> he's got posters on his wall, and yeah. So you know, it's funny I, I though you like... get you get a oh, yeah. lot of like, you know, you're hanging out with a family, or whatever, and you're talking with a cousin or aunt or uncle about like what they're watching on TV. 
lately and you, you mentioned some true crime thing and then you know nine times out of ten like they'll look around and whisper be like you watch those two i love those you know, like, <laughs> big secret yeah yeah like, what do you what do you think our fascination is with true crime like just kind of the morbid because it you know you your book's nonfiction, but it, or sorry your book's fiction but it feels like a nonfiction, like a true mm-hmm. thing and you watch the documentaries and stuff what do you think just i guess as like a culture our obsession is with true crime stuff yeah i in mean your opinion you no know, there's the whole like psych 101 thing about being able to confront what scares you in in a in a comfortable place in a place where you don't feel threatened you know that's mm-hmm. kind of like the reason they give why a lot of people like you know violent horror movies and stuff like that right. but uh and you know that makes sense to me although i do think it is a little different when it comes to true crime stuff because it is real stuff that happened to real people and there yeah. are people like survivors who were you know watching basically their trauma being turned into entertainment for people you know and i think that's a, a conversation that's been coming up a lot more more recently about kind of like the monetization of people's trauma and when when you think about it that way you know it's 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 i don't know it, it gives me pause you know you know that i'm i'm consuming this stuff and it's it's entertainment you know yeah. and you could you know you could say it's it's newsworthy it's being presented for you know whatever public benefit whatever but in the end you know it is about it's no it's no coincidence that we're getting more and more of it because it's what people want so you know people want something and they're going to get more of it because it sells you know so there is something I'm not necessarily saying like, you know, people who watch too much of this stuff are going to become serial killers. Like, you know, that's not really realistic, but there is something to be said about, I don't know, just how we just, you know, like how we treat other people's grief and stuff like that. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I always feel hesitant to say I I like true crime because that seems like not the right word. It's more like I'm curious about it. Yeah. I mean, the bottom like line is like they're they're stories, they're human stories, and you know, right. a lot of them are inherently mysteries. And at least for me, that's probably one of the most fascinating parts is the mystery of this stuff, yeah. you know. And then to find like finding like people really do get invested in finding out the truth and also mm-hmm. like the 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 justice angle of stuff with something like the West Memphis Three, where those documentaries were made, and you know, those kids were sitting in jail for like years and years and through the documentaries and the and the awareness it raised they were eventually not technically exonerated but released from prison you know yeah there's that that special uh uh, deal they took where it's like Mm -hmm. they they still have it on their record that they they were guilty but it's not enough to to keep them in there and yeah because the government doesn't want to admit culpability that they did something wrong so they're like all right we'll let you go but we're still not going to say we made a mistake you know yeah, yeah. and if you watch those too because i got really invested in that whole story you got you saw it was a, a small town that just dropped the ball everywhere with the investigation oh, yeah. with that like there was so much that they missed and so little that they did because just because there was like three weird kids basically yeah you know that this could yeah. be a whole another two hours to talk about that whole case oh, yeah. I, got yeah, really, I got really invested in that so yeah i've seen all those movies and yeah. follow-ups and like it was it was fascinating and i think in that case, one of the reason people get so invented is like they really feel the injustice of it and want to see, yeah. you yeah. know, the right thing done. But I don't necessarily think that's the case with all true crime media. Right. You know, some you know some of it is a lot more salacious than others and doesn't maybe necessarily have its heart in the right place. Like the stuff with like Zodiac and stuff, that's the mystery for me. Like who was who was it? Same with like yeah, Jack yeah. the Ripper and. You know, spent ones like that that we'll never know and then with the one like uh the memphis three and the one you talked about earlier the making a murder like I remember watching that was like he didn't do anything they're setting him up or whatever mm-hmm. like, i was so invested in it thinking that the small town had set him up or whatever yeah I mean, you got, it's different, there's different aspects of, of the things i guess too yeah definitely yeah if, if you, look, you look at the true crime and then you look at all the documentaries and it's something you have then you look at the other side of it the entertainment factor where they're making these 
uh, fictional movies, but so mm-hmm. many of them are based on true crimes. Yeah, like Zach Efron is Ted Bundy yeah. or whatever. How, yeah, how, yeah. How, how many how many Jack Ripper movies are out there? Series yeah. and stuff, you know, that they're taking and they're kind of making some of these serial killers iconic in a way because they're glorifying. You know, we're, we got a whole series on this killer from London now. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So it's an entertainment factor to to make a buck. Really, I feel like it's always been like that. Like the killers become famous, almost like these movie stars in a way. And then, like, you can never remember like the victims' names. At least I can't. Right. I can't name like yeah. any of the victims. Right. Like I can cu- sometimes kind of remember the actress with the Charles Manson murders. Every mm-hmm. now and then, I can remember her name, but like for the most part, I couldn't tell you one victim's name. How many? How many Dahmer up, movies have there? And they're, yeah, oh, I can rattle off all these serial yeah. killers. Yeah. It's such yeah, a twisted that, thing again, to focus on them <laughs> instead of. You know, the victims. And that's a, another kind of reason why I made letters to the Purple Satin Killer all from the other people, not just from him. Because they're not necessarily all victims. But it's been in some way either related to victims or, you know, had some sort of relationship with him. And I wanted it to keep it, keep it from really, like, descending into that you know, glorification of, you know, mm-hmm. someone who's right. done these awful things by making, by making the story from these other people's point of view and making it about their stories more than the killer stories. I felt that was kind of a, a good way of doing that. I feel like that was a, a really unique format for the whole thing. It all being from other people and all being letters. I really enjoyed, like, I don't think I've read anything really like it either. Even other epistolatory stuff this feels quite different from that kind of stuff. Cause there's, mm. there's like an arc, there's all these little arcs and yeah. one overall arc. I really enjoy the way this, this is it. a lot more in depth. I think than some of the other epistolatory. Mm. Yeah, you've it. got like the timeline in the back <laughs> and like all the characters in the front, I, like yeah. every letter, yeah. if it was someone new, I'd go back to the front and say, Oh, this is, you know, whoever this is, the call of duty player, or, you know, the auto yeah, yeah. account or whatever. I like yeah, that yeah. you did that in the front, having the, the correspondence names and, yeah, again, that was important to me because it, I took so much time with the timeline and the dates and all that stuff, and I wanted it to be accessible for the reader so they could reference it in case mm-hmm. they were confused, almost like in yeah. real true crime books where they have, you know, the timeline and dates and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. I did every, every time it was someone new, I would go back and reference <laughs> in the beginning. It's like, okay, that's who this person is. So yeah, I, I really yeah. like that you added that in. Poor yeah, and, and that's especially for me because, like, I'm a person who I, if I read a book and it, there's like a ton of characters, like, I'm immediately like, what the hell? I don't know who's <laughs> who. And I got to, like, write down names and stuff to keep everything straight, you know? Yeah. So, speaking what? of, you had so many, there's like, I don't know if you know off the top of your head, but there's like 30 or 40 ish people that have written mm-hmm. letters from their perspective. Was it, how hard was it to, make each individual person like have their own voice where they didn't feel like, Oh, Josh wrote all these letters mm-hmm. under these characters names. They're like, this is Judith and this is Abigail and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. That was definitely another big concern that was important to me. And that kind of falls under the same umbrella of the kind of like the timeline and math stuff, just my kind of obsessiveness over everything has to be its own thing and stand out and in order. And um, that was one of the things I was worried about was just having, because there are so many different letter writers just having the voices kind of just blend together and all basically just sounding like my voice. Um, I did a similar thing with my first novel, The Paradox Twins, just to a much lesser extent. There was maybe three or four different characters, and it was kind of like a compilation of excerpts from different books they had written. And, you know, so one was like a memoir and one was like a fictionalized account. And then... um, you know, it had some other, there were like elements of screenplay and stuff in it. And so I, I did that there, but this was on a much bigger level. And um, with, with Paradox Twins, I gave myself rules for the three or four different main characters in how I wrote their voice, where I would be like, all right, this one, because they're younger, they'll use less formal language, they'll use contractions, they'll use slang, they'll maybe say things grammatically incorrect. And then this character, because they're older and they're a school teacher, they'll, their writing will be more formal, they'll use bigger words um, than another character. Um, you know, it's, you know, just stuff like that, basically, like these kind of grammatical rules. 
And mm -hmm. with Letters to the Purple Sun Killer, I couldn't really be that exact with every single one. Yeah. Um, I did do stuff where, like, with the mother, Judith, like, I would say, like, oh, she she's older, so she wouldn't, you know, use a lot of contractions or stuff like that. Or like, this character, because they are younger, they're going to have very, sh this character will have very short sentences. This character will write in, like, run-on sentences, you know? Um, so I, I did a lot of stuff like that. And then just basically who they were kind of then dictated the voice, I feel. Like, you know, some have more space and are more obvious than others. Like, you know, the mother and Ginny, like, it was too hard. Like, I, I you know. So it basically like where who they were as characters kind of dictated their voice. Uh -huh. I feel, you know, the uh, the author that writes them a few times. His intros always crack me up because he was like, "What's up, fuck stick or whatever he said every time." <laughs> oh, El, yeah. was it Lin, it's like Elmer yeah. or somebody. I can't remember. Yeah. He cracked me up every time. Uh, Elron James, I believe. Yeah, that's him. Elron. Yeah, I kind of I kind of based him not hidden the famous crime writer because speaks in the, this weird slang and is like very kind of like pompous and over the top and talking about himself as like the greatest writer in the world and stuff like that. And so, his yeah. letters crap me up. I like, yeah. loved his intros every yeah. time. <laughs> letters to the Another purple satin killer. That's what we're talking about this evening. Josh Richard Plinsky, uh, August 6th is what we're looking at for a release from clash. Uh, definitely, uh, I think both Brad and I, we recommend, right? I'm going to speak yeah, was, for you, Brad. Was, I really like the, uh, I did. It yeah. was very different. And I've really, I just love the layout of it. And no. How I'll, it told a story. Yeah. It would be great if he said no. His answer was no. I, 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 I was waiting for him. He's, he's, he's going to say no one of these episodes. One of these episodes, yeah. he's going to say he's no. He's like, no, nah, not, not yeah. really. I, I didn't quite care for it. <laughs> we're, we're just yeah. trying to, try to embarrass the guest. But, yeah. Uh, I've just been Joshua, like, oh, all right, thanks. <laughs> Well, we appreciate you wanting to stop by and, and chat about this with the two bozos with microphones here. We appreciate that. And uh, uh, good luck in the future with this book. I, I think, you know, word of mouth, like we were talking about earlier, I, I, I've already seen a lot of uh, people say they've checked it out. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be pretty cool once uh, the release date, more people pick it up. Awesome. Uh, yeah. well, I mean, thank you guys so much for having me. It was a great conversation. And I really appreciate you helping me spread the word. Yep. Joshua Traplinski, our, our guest for this evening, uh, again, August 6th from Clash, Letters to the Purple Satin Killer. Uh, be sure to pick that up. And uh, that's a wrap for this Saturday edition of Paper Cuts for uh, the co-host over there, Brad, all the way to Kentucky. <laughs> I'm Jay. Thanks to our special guest, Josh. And that's a wrap, everyone. See you next time. See ya. Josh, we Thank appreciate you, you hanging Good out. Night. I really, I really enjoyed the book. It was, it was really cool, especially just the way Thank it was you. laid out. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. That really means a lot. Jay, love you, Jay. All I right. know you do. This is where you <laughs> have to end it now. <laughs>